unmet needs. One of the most common and certainly one of the most profound misconceptions of economics involves unmet needs. Politicians, journalists, and academic academicians are almost continuously pointing out unmet needs in our society that should be supplied by some government program or other. Most of these are things that most of us wish our society have more of, had more of. What is wrong with that? Let us go back to square one. If economics is the study of the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses, then it follows that there will always be unmet needs. Some particular desires can be singled out and met 100%, but that only means that other desires will be even more unfulfilled than they are now. Anyone who has driven in most big cities will undoubtedly feel that there is an unmet need for more parking spaces. But while it is both economically and technologically possible to build cities in such a way as to have a parking space available for anyone who wants one anywhere in the city at any hour of the day or night, does it follow that we should do it? The cost of building vast new underground parking garages, or of tearing down existing buildings to create parking garages above ground, or of designing new cities with fewer buildings and more parking lots, would all be astronomically costly. What other things are we prepared to give up in order to have this automotive utopia? Fewer hospitals? Less police protection? Fewer fire departments? Are we prepared to put up with even more unmet needs in these areas? Maybe some would give up public libraries in order to have more places to park. But whatever choices are made, and however it is done, there will still be more unmet needs elsewhere, as a result of meeting an unmet need for more parking spaces. We may differ among ourselves as to what is worth sacrificing in order to have more of something else. The point here is more fundamental. Merely demonstrating an unmet need is not sufficient to say that it should be met, not when resources are scarce and have alternative uses. In the case of parking spaces, what might appear to be cheaper, when measured only by government expenditures, would be to restrict or forbid the use of private automobiles in cities, adjusting the number of cars to the number of existing parking spaces instead of vice versa. Moreover, passing and enforcing such a law would cost a tiny fraction of the cost of greatly expanding the number of parking spaces. But this saving in government expenditures would have to be weighed against the vast private expenditures currently devoted to the purchase, maintenance, and parking of automobiles in cities. Obviously, these expenditures would not have been, undertake, would not have been undertaken in the first place if those who pay these prices did not find the benefits to be worth it to them. To go back to square one again, costs are foregone opportunities not government expenditures. Forcing thousands of peoples to forego opportunities for which they have willingly paid vast amounts of money is a cost that may far outweigh the money saved by not having to build more parking spaces or do the other things necessary to accommodate cars in cities. None of this says we should have either more parking spaces or fewer parking spaces in cities. What it says is that the way this issue and many others is presented makes no sense in a world of scarce resources which have alternative uses. That is a world of trade-offs, not solutions, and whatever trade-off is decided upon will still leave unmet needs. So long as we respond gullibly to political rhetoric about unmet needs, we will arbitrarily choose to shift resources to whatever the featured unmet need of the day happens to be and away from other things. Then, when another politician, or perhaps even the same politician at a later time, discovers that robbing Peter to pay Paul has left Peter worse off, and now wants to help Peter meet his unmet needs, we will start shifting resources in another direction. In short, we will be like a dog chasing his tail in a circle and getting no closer, no matter how fast he runs. This is not to say that we have the ideal trade-offs already and should leave them alone. Rather, it says that whatever trade-offs we make or change should be seen from the outset as trade-offs, not needing unmet needs. 
The very word needs arbitrarily puts some desires on a higher plane than others as categorically more important. But however urgent it may be to have some food and some water, for example, in order to sustain life itself, nevertheless, beyond some point, both become not only unnecessary, but even counterproductive and dangerous. Widespread obesity among Americans shows that food has already reached that point, and anyone who has suffered the ravages of flood, even if it is only a flooded basement, knows that water can reach that point as well. In short, even the most urgently required things remain necessary only within a given range. We cannot live half an hour without oxygen, but even oxygen beyond some concentration levels can promote the growth of cancer and has been known to make newborn babies blind for life. There is a reason why hospitals do not use oxygen tanks willy-nilly. In short, nothing is a need categorically, regardless of how urgent it may be to have particular amounts at particular times and places. Unfortunately, most laws and government policies apply categorically, if only because of the dangers in leaving every government official to become a petty despot in interpreting what those laws and policies mean and when they should apply. In this context, calling something a need categorically is playing with fire. Many complaints that some basically good government policy has been applied stupidly may fail to address the underlying problem of categorical laws in an incremental world. There may not have been any intelligent way to apply categorically a policy designed to meet desires whose benefits vary incrementally and ultimately cease to be benefits. By its very nature, as a study of the use of scarce resources which have alternative uses, economics is about incremental trade-offs, not about needs or solutions. That may be why economists have never been as popular as politicians who promise to solve our problems and meet our needs.